Hi, I'm Jonathan Ricco. I'm a faculty member in the Institute of Philosophy of Mind and Cognition at National Yangming Jiao Tong University. Right now, I'm researching history and philosophy of science. Back when I was in high school, I hated science. But you might wonder, how did I end up studying history and philosophy of science? A lot of people have the experience in high school you have your high school science classes. What do you do in your high school science classes? You memorize facts for the test, figure out the correct way to solve the problems on your homework assignments. Sometimes you do lab assignments, and I would always do it wrong and get the wrong answers. It wasn't until I started studying history and philosophy of science in college when I was an undergrad, that I found out that science could be interesting. One of the reasons that I thought science was interesting is that scientists can be wrong about things. So in high school, we all kind of learn the facts as if science is right about everything. It's one of the most important methods is trial and error. And of course, error is a big part of that method. Scientists can be wrong and they keep trying until something works. So one of the things I thought was interesting about history and philosophy of science is you look at the errors. You look at the ways in which scientists go wrong even if they had very good reasons for thinking that their theories were correct. For example, if you look at science 100, 200 years ago, scientists said things that we now consider to be false. But their theories were still good in a lot of respects. They had good evidence for thinking what they did. Uh, they could use their theories to do various things. They guided their experiments. They could make very accurate predictions about things that would happen in the future under certain conditions. But on some level, those theories were just wrong. Uh, one of the things that I think is most interesting is uh, how you can be wrong for really good reasons and how you can have a theory that's really good in some ways, maybe for predicting things and for performing experiments. And maybe you have good reasons for believing that theory, but you turn out to be wrong. If that sort of thing happened 100, 200 years ago, one of the questions that you can ask is, what about our theories today? That's one of the main things that interests me about history and philosophy of science. My current research builds on what I just talked about regarding how you can have theories that are false in various ways, but still good in various ways, maybe predictively successful, maybe good for guiding and performing experiments and that sort of thing. So these questions that you can ask about our best theories in science, you can ask, are they true? Are they approximately true? Do they contain only parts? that are true or approximately true? Uh, is what they say about things that we can observe generally true? Uh, what about things that we cannot observe? Things like electrons or genes, our current best theories, what they say about those sorts of things. Are those sorts of claims true or approximately true? Uh, you can also ask questions about existence. So unobservable entities like electrons, atoms, genes, uh, do they exist? Do we have good enough evidence for thinking they exist? Or are those theories that talk about atoms and genes, for example, good for various purposes, but we don't necessarily need to believe in the existence of, for example, atoms or electrons? If you start asking these questions, the sort of debate in the philosophy of science that tries to address these questions is called the scientific realism debate. My research generally focuses on that debate. I also teach courses regarding that debate. I've taught graduate seminars on the scientific realism debate where we get into the topic of my current research and also these questions. Uh, the other courses that I teach include courses like critical and creative thinking. We get into reasoning, what makes reasoning good, what makes reasoning bad. We talk about uh, different kinds of reasoning. I also teach courses in academic writing. Those are the main things that I teach. A lot of our students come here, of course, to study philosophy of mind and cognition. One of the approaches that you see a lot among the faculty members and graduate students in our institute is to have a kind of interdisciplinary approach. 
where you're drawing not just on philosophy, but on sciences like cognitive neuroscience, psychology, and so on. One of the ways in which my research interests complement that kind of approach is because my research interests are relevant to science. Uh, one of the things that you can get from the scientific realism debate is a different perspective on science. If you look at what's going on in current science and past science, it may not be the best idea to take everything that scientists say as the truth. And of course, you wouldn't want to be skeptical about every single thing scientists say. Sometimes they have really good evidence for the claims that they make, and so you wouldn't want to be a complete science skeptic either. Uh, approaching this issue from the perspective of the scientific realism debate, I hope would give you maybe a more sophisticated perspective on the ways that our current science can inform these questions about the mind and cognition.